Welcome to the global phenomenon, Surviving the Survivor, where we bring you the best guests in all of true crime. This is a STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case. Here's your host, Emmy Award-winning journalist, Joel Waldman. What's up, STS Nation, and welcome to another episode of Surviving the Survivor, the podcast that promises and delivers the very best guests in true crime. And this is an STS special, Surviving My Biggest Case, where we get former FBI agents and other law enforcement officers uh, and officials to come on here and tell us about one of the biggest cases that they uh, embarked on during their professional uh, storied careers. Uh, tonight, we are joined by former special FBI agent Jeff Wood. Uh, he is retired now out of Boston. He focused on gangs and gang violence and is a seasoned investigator. And if he looks familiar, it's because he's come on the show uh, several times uh, before with both Dr. Ann Burgess of uh, Netflix Mindhunter fame and uh, Dr. Gary Bricado. So, uh, Jeff, welcome to you. Great to have you back. Um, we were just talking uh, offline for a second and I uh, want to say thanks for your service, but also thanks to both of your parents' service. They both uh, served time uh, in the Vietnam War. I don't think I've ever met someone who's where both parents were over there. So, uh, you know, kudos to you and your family for the service that they have uh, done for this country. Uh, it's an amazing, uh, amazing tale. Well, thank you. And it's unique when my father lost his hand as he shipped through the the hospitals on his way back to the States. His last military hospital that he was in before being medically retired was the hospital my mom was assigned to after completing her tour in Vietnam. So they met when she was actually taking care of him at the hospital. Oh, wow. That's that's really interesting and even more special. Um, so we're going to get right into it. Um Tell me about this case. I mean, I know you handled narcotics, uh, just so everyone knows. Uh, we don't discuss these cases ahead of time. I want this to be like a conversation at a coffee shop. So I have absolutely no idea uh, what Jeff is going to tell me. Um, by the way, Jeff, does anyone ever say that you look a little like Woody Harrelson? Do you get that? I do get that, actually. I, I've gotten Woody Harrelson. I've gotten, I forget the guy who plays Jake on Brooklyn Nine-Nine. I don't know who that is. Uh, he's a comedian. For uh, is it Andy Samberg, that guy? Yes, yes. They, say, <laughs> they, they make fun of me for that. So I get both of those those actors, comedians. I see the Woody Harrelson. I don't know about the Andy Samberg. But anyway, uh, we digress for a minute. So you're working uh, narcotics and doing a lot of drug stuff in Boston. I assume this is going to have to do with that. But what, what's the story? Uh, when does it unfold? How do you get on this case? Well, let me let me back up real quick for you. I would say one, I use narcotic laws and RICO laws to target gang members, but I did gang investigations and there's a big difference between doing a gang investigation and doing a drug slash narcotic investigation. I it's gonna be hard for me to actually narrow it down right away. You may need to ask me a few questions because I've participated in many cases where my partner and I back in 2010 said, Hey, we just made the biggest case of our careers. This is it. We're going to be on the downside of our careers, helping new agents, new ta uh, troopers, uh, new task force officers make their big cases. And that didn't happen. We continue to make huge cases until we both retired at the end. But my partner and I, um, my main partner, I mean, I had many partners, but a trooper who was a young trooper, I was a new agent. We, we came on board. We were on the task force, but we participated and first met during 9-11, then came together working gangs together, ended up working the Boston Marathon bombing together, and then all types of gangs we've worked with. Latin Kings, Gangster Disciples, Latin Gangster Disciples, Bloods, Crips, uh, MS-13, Hells Angels, Outlaws, numerous um, neighborhood-based type gangs. I would say that we as a task force, because I, I never say I, I, I could do anything alone, no 
law enforcement officer really can do anything alone without their partner, without people helping them, right? But we as a, as a gang task force, I think we culminated our entire work together when we were all together with targeting and conducting the largest federal RICO case against MS-13, which ended in, we, well, we ended the proactive phase in 2016, mm. that case. Wow. Wow. Um, so take us into this. Wait, wait us into the waters about how everything is. This what you were going to. I was going to work in this unless you take me somewhere else. No, no, this is it. No, no, no. So, I mean, so I, tell me, how does this how does this all start? When and where? Well, for us as a task force, it, it, it started in 2002. We first started looking at MS-13. You know, at the time, back in the early parts of, uh, of the, the century, MS-13 already had a f- solid foothold in, in Los Angeles, Cal- in parts of California, Texas, North Carolina, Virginia, New York. We had a presence in Boston, but they had stayed somewhat low-key. Uh, 2002, they came up on our radar more so when uh, a clique, several members of, a, of one of the local cliques, raped two women, both of whom had some type of disability. One was in a wheelchair. So it it did come to our attention. But at that time, uh, most of our cases against gang members, we utilized uh, drug laws. We utilized uh, firearm laws uh, to to charge our gang members. We always try to go out and prove our RICO, prove our RICO conspiracy cases against these gangs. But the U.S. attorneys were a little gun shy. Uh, back in the mid '90s, a RICO case had been conducted against a neighborhood gang, and the main targets all were found not guilty during trial uh, for many different reasons. So it's a lot of work. You, you typically get more trials out of RICO cases than you do a simple drug case. So in that time frame, when we started, the U.S. attorney's office had only two prosecutors help working with the gang task force. And there was only two FBI agents assigned me and my partner initially. So in, with the, with state police, local police, uh, county police uh, and the sheriffs. So there wasn't a big push in Boston for a lot of gang cases. And we mm-hmm. ended up getting to the point where we brought in more agents, more task force officers, and we created big, uh, a bigger presence targeting gangs and the u.s attorneys grew and and developed more u.s attorneys and we got lucky during one of our cases we did a vicar which is a violent crime in aid of racketeering case against the hell's angels and we made some small rico conspiracy cases against the outlaws so when we started targeting ms-13 we had more of a buy-in to use the rico law so we started in 2002 kind of looking, monitoring, paying attention to MS-13. Yeah. And Jeff, real quick, for those who don't know, I mean, MS-13, I believe, is from El Salvador. That's where it origin- the gang originated, and they are um, ruthless as they come. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so the, the gang was created in 1979, 1980 in, in L.A. with El Salvadoran immigrants. Mm-hmm. I would say back then it was considered more of an American gang. It was founded in in America, even though it was an El Salvadorian predominantly based gang, it was still founded in America. So they followed more of the American gang rules. Uh, But by the the 80s and 90s, as non-citizens who were members of the gangs were committing felonies and getting convicted upon the, 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 the conclusion of their sentence, they were deported back to Central America, El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras primarily. And I would say that's when it morphed more into a El Salvadorian Central American gang with that war mentality that you had based on a country that had the Civil War back in the 80s. And so it was it became much more violent. So it, it has become a much more violent gang. I would say in my experience after 20, 20 years of conducting gang investigations, it was – the most violent gang I ever investigated. I won't say I had had more violent gang members 
in certain cases, but overall, I've never seen a gang so quick to kill one of their own they suspect of being a law enforcement cooperator or, or kill anyone. Uh, to join the gang uh, by the end there, by 2015, you had to kill at least one person if you were in America to become a full plan member. In El Salvador, they're killing five people before they're qualify to be a full-blown member and we're talking they're recruiting 11 so at 15 years of age we have by the true definition of 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 a serial killer serial killers at 15 who are coming into the country wow and and obviously they're uh severely depraved because uh you just said that they're uh raping uh one woman was in a wheelchair uh was there a method uh, this is morbid, but is there a method that they used for their killings? Was it stabbings generally? Would they shoot? They'll do whatever they can to kill, but mm. they want – when they plan a kill for you to go out and, and start earning your bones, mm. yes, it's with a knife. Uh, in our case alone, we had several murders where the victims were stabbed over 40 times, stoned. But, you know, in one case, the, the kid who was killed, one of the knives, when they stabbed him in the chest, broke off. We found the knife blade that was broken next to him. And later, based on a lot of hard work, we found the actual knife with the broken edge that had been tossed in the ocean by where, where the kid was killed. Wow. Um, so let's backpedal here. So it's 2002. That's when your work begins. Um what specifically were you like going after here or was well, it generally just to get them, you know, as, as much off the streets as you could? Well, yes, we were looking to develop informants. We weren't very successful. So uh, the, the state police, the local police who were members of the task force would work with Homeland Security Investigations, HSI and ICE. And we did a lot of sweeps where we arrested known gang members and deported them back to the El Salvador. Because we weren't we, we weren't having the success that we wanted to infiltrate the gang. When we do our gang investigations, we need gang members who we somehow develop, make them a source, so that way we can put the wires and cameras on them and, and gather our evidence with, of, of the criminal activities they're conducting. So without that in to the gang, it's very hard for us to, to, to make the case we want to make. So... I would say around 2012, 2013, in that time frame, we had a couple things that came to be. I had been tasked with many different things, so I was working a couple different things. But one of my partners was tasked, uh, the state police, he was a state police at that time uh, sergeant, but he and I had been working, I, I mentioned him, Mario Millet, great, great partner. I can't speak highly enough of him, but uh, we found out that there's there was this program where El Salvador and Guatemala and Honduran police come to the states. Uh, they get married up with local police and or det- and detectives in different cities, and they would travel to two or three cities in the country where there was a large MS-13 presence. And this time, they had picked Boston to be uh, one of the cities, so he. You know, since it was all local and state, we asked my partner to to be our point of contact and our, our rep. And so he agreed the, you know, 50 troop uh, police officers come up. They're partnered up with some cops from Miami, D.C., uh, my partner, Mario. They see how large of a Central American population we have in, in the Boston area and, and where MS-13 is. And then they go out to L.A., and then they go to El Salvador. So my partner goes with them to L.A. to see the problem in L.A., and then they all go to El Salvador. And while in Salvador, uh, we have FBI agents assigned to the Transnational Anti-Gang Unit. So in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, we'll have agents. And we basically hand-select police, local police officers to work with those agents. They're constantly vetted to ensure that they're 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 solid police officers and they work in disrupting dismantling ms-13 in those countries so one of my one of my who became somewhat of a partner but one of the agents down there 
great guy, loves Mario. No one dislikes Mario. He's the greatest guy, the funniest guy. Makes fun of me left and right because I'm an easy prey to his jokes and jabs. I'm not quick at the comebacks. But they partner up and he goes, hey, I got a kid I want you to meet. And so he introduces him to to this kid and we called him Mako in our our, we gave him a code name. His name was codenamed Mako. But before that, they meet and they talk. And it turns out Mako had been in the States for some time, was not a part of the gang, never part, was never part of the gang. But while living in Miami, got connected to some Mexican cartels and became a huge drug dealer. I mean, owning a couple of houses, million dollar homes, mm. so the DEA grabs him and then he cooperates to reduce a sentence and testifies against the cartel members. Well, they had to put him in a safe location before they deport him. So after doing five years, he's, he spends time in a local deportation facility in Boston and meets some MS-13 members. So when he goes back to El Salvador, he quickly realizes, I want to go back to the States. This is not where I'm used to living <laughs> and approaches the FBI, the tag in El Salvador starts communicating and they said, Oh, he has a connection to, to Boston introduces to Mario. Mario comes back and a new partner of, of ours, a new FBI agent who worked gangs in California had transferred in. And so he was tasked with, with, Hey, opening a new case, a big case against MS 13. So they travel back to El Salvador, interview him and then start to process a lengthy process of bringing this kid back into the States to work for us. And and that's how we ended up starting the case. It, it, I would just help at that time. I'd offer advice. I was the senior agent on the squad with the most gang experience. So there were, I had a lot of advice, a lot of experience. So they came to me a lot, but I was not a part of the case fully yet. But nine, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing happens. Well, our agent's family was inside the restaurant that was right outside of where the second bomb went off. And he had very young kids who suffered PTSD after watching everyone get uh, injured during the bombing. So in order to get them the help they needed, they transferred him back to California to go back to work there because they needed that distance. So the Bureau did a lot of work, got them traded. And at that point for about a year, a year and a half, case agents were getting passed around to work this case. And no one, no, the, the one agent just what didn't have his heart in it. So I would try to help out, but uh, I wasn't assigned yet. So I'd give advice. I tried to help out. Finally, someone else came in, and he had worked drugs for a while. So he he got transferred from Denver. Great agent, but just his heart wasn't involved fully in the case. So he was told, hey, if you get it done, you get to move to a, a, a something where you want to go. So the US the, the one attorney had said, hey, I think we're good. We'll, we'll finish what we have. But my partner kept coming to me and said, hey, I don't want you to, but they called me the fixer, the Band-Aid, whenever there was something that needed to be fixed or – Take care of is like I called it. I was like the closer almost, I guess. Is the way. Yeah. So he, I gave him advice, and then before you knew it, my main partner at the U.S. Attorney's Office, the the head of the gang unit, called my boss and said, "Hey, there's stuff going on here, and we need Jeff to to finish it." And he didn't like it, but he finally did. And so in early 2015, I finally get assigned to be the case agent. So we had a lot of things going on, but at that point, well, hang on a sec. So what was the code name for this guy who, uh, was Mako? So Mako. where is, so, so now we're in 2015. Is Mako still in the picture here? Mako still in the picture. So 2013, we finally get him in the country mm-hmm. and he starts go, we, we start just saying, Hey, go out, meet MS 13 El Salvadoran guys and try and, and get in. So initially he got up there and tried to call somebody he knew that he had spent some jail time with. Mm-hmm. And when I talk about, I mentioned earlier how violent they are, the kid had kind of made a mistake. So when, when Mako calls and says, Hey, I got myself back in the country. The kid thought that the MS 13 leadership had sent him up to kill him. So he mm-hmm. ducked him 
and, and like wouldn't answer his calls and wouldn't do anything. So our way into the gang was floundering. So at that point we started. And, doing things. and are, is he at this point is a guy like Mako, is he wired? Do you have him wired to try when he's trying we, to get this? When we're ready to, we will. But at that point, okay. we had him fully. Okay. Wired, right. Okay. So, so at that point, they end up giving him the, the, the whole goal was, is the whole goal was to do undercover drug operations with Mako. He was a drug dealer. He knew the drug world. So he wanted to get into some MS-13 guys and use them to protect him as he did his drug business. Mm -hmm. So they've become part of a drug conspiracy. So here we go. He He's going out there. We've given him some, like, contraband handbags like Louis Vuitton knockoff handbags to try and sell, to meet people, trying to do things. He finally meets some MS-13 gang members who bring him in. And we do a couple deals where, you know, he meets another cover officer. He gets five keys of Coke. You've got five, six MS-13 guys who provide protection as he drives to another location out into New Hampshire, meets another undercover, gets the money, pays everyone for the protection. So we do a few deals. But lo and behold, it's 2014 now, or the end of 2013, getting close to 2014 and lo and behold, one night he's hanging out with the guys. We, you know, he's he's just done the drug deals, and they go, "Hey, if you're going to continue hanging out with us, you got to become a member." And they jump him in that night. Mm. And, and so, what, and what does that what does that mean in uh, layman's terms when they jump him in? They beat the crap out of him for 13 seconds. They'll count to 13, and three to five MS-13 homeboys pummel, kick you, you fight back, and at the end mm. of 13 seconds, they come in, bless you in, and your, no. your homeboy. So he okay. becomes homeboy. He calls us up the next thing. We meet him. He's got a black eye. And he's like, you'll never believe what's going to happen. And I'm an MS-13 gang member, which opened the door for us. He's now in. And so no. he... But he is, he is Mexican, right? No, he's El Salvadoran. Oh, he is. He is. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So okay. He's El Salvadorian. He's hanging with, we termed, an older clique. In Boston, we had about eight, nine clicks operating in Boston. He was with an older click, the uh, uh, East Side Loco Savatuchas click. So they weren't quite as violent because everyone was older and they had already committed all their violent acts to get into to, to become homeboys. So they weren't out there seeking to kill like the other cliques had that, that had the younger Paros and Chiqueos who are the up and coming members who are getting to the homeboy status, like the full fledged members. So he's now tasked. Uh, we wire up his car. He's a taxi cab driver. So he drives them everywhere and he's out now getting them to admit to all different kinds of crimes that they're committing. So we had one instance uh, in December of 2014, uh, a homeboy shoots and kills somebody at a after act, after hours bar, which is more like a, a house party. Um, he walks in there and shoots this kid who was uh, a rival gang member. And he gets called later that night and says, hey, you know, we need you to move something. So he thought he was going to get the gun and get rid of the gun that was using the murder. And so he gets to his car. He's called us. We're getting no, we're getting ready to to do whatever. He just he's smart enough where he disables the rear light in his car. So when you're driving down the road, that that lights out the brake light, mm -hmm. the, the light. So yeah. when he pulls up the murderer jumps in his car who we had already identified, already had an arrest warrant for that. One of the leaders of clicks jumps in the car and they go, we're going to New Jersey and they're driving on the turnpike and Mario gets in his uniform. He gets in a unmarked cruiser, but it's still a cruiser. And he pulls him over and gives Mako a ticket or a warning for having the light out. But while he's talking to everyone, he goes, hold on a second, comes back with the wanted flyer and goes, you're so-and-so. He pulls the kid out and arrests him oh, for shit. the murder. Um, and it's very he did, scary. He did, Mario did this. Why? He, he, he oh, did no, this. We were, we were close by, but, okay. you know, 
we weren't we were there if we, if if he needed us, but we were far enough back that they couldn't see Got it. It. Oh, it, was okay. the, it was dark on the pike, so. Got it. Got it. Because that's I mean that's a very dangerous stop, isn't it? Oh, very dangerous stop. So, yeah. but we we take a lot of precautions when we do these things. So we knew because we had uh, we we knew what was going on. We'd been notified. He'd been texting us. So we we got him arrested. And literally, as soon as Mario put him in the cruiser and took off, this leader who was called Big Crazy because he is, you know, Big Crazy. We ended up charging him with two homicides. Wow. And, uh, and other criminal actions for our RICO conspiracy. But he accuses Mako of being a rat, and he goes out and shows him the light, and that's the only thing that saved his life. They would have tried to kill him if they had thought that. Well, so, Real quick, real because not everyone knows what RICO is. It has to do with racketeering. Can you just explain like how, why you went about using RICO uh, statutes? Yeah, so RICO is the Racketeering Influential Corruption Act. So when you have an organization – which can be in, like just it's not illegal to be a member of a gang in the country. Yeah, but that's how they went after the mob. Ultimately. Right. And so the, the, the Rico statues were made to go after the mob. But you could have a business that's committing Rico acts that could be charged. People can be charged with Rico. So with the Rico laws and Rico conspiracy, basically they say we can charge you with Rico if you commit two predicate acts. And so predicate acts can be drug dealing, prostitution, money laundering, uh, tax evasion, armed robbery, murder, attempted murder. Um, there's a few more, obviously. But if you commit two or more of those acts and you're a member of an organization and all these acts, they're used to further that criminal organization or the criminal activities of that organization, you can charge those people with RICO. So you know, we can charge leaders for different crimes that they may not have actually fully committed, but they're getting compensated for them. So if I'm sending money up the chain of command, you as the leader may have never sold crack during this case, but because you're getting money from me from the crack I'm selling on behalf of the gang, you're still responsible for the conspiracy of that distribution of of illegal narcotics. So you've now committed one of the predicate acts by receiving compensation for this right so Mm -hmm. this leader big crazy when we charged him the predicate acts we charged him with were uh two murders that he had ordered and planned uh conspiracy to distribute over five kilograms or five five kilos of cocaine using a firearm in possession uh, to protect that cocaine distribution act, so we had, and then being the leader of the gang. So there, here's the five things. And after my first four hours of testifying, that went for about four days, three to four days. He came back and said, "Hey, can you offer me a plea deal?" And the U.S. attorney told the the, the attorney, the defense attorney, he's like, no "What we do? He's still looking at life in prison. You know, if we take away one of the murders, he's still committed." participated mm-hmm. murder and he used a gun with the key with the drugs and he's a leader so he's it's life if we try and drop he, he, he killed more than two people are you oh, convinced I, I i absolutely believe he did but in our case that we had evidence on got it, was, it. right got so it. by the way was big crazy a big fat guy or just a big crazy he, he, just- he was on the heavier side yes <laughs> um, he was That's he was not- a big guy um his so um, he if was, you're uh, if you're sitting in prison and they say uh, your inmates coming in, his name is Big Crazy. I'd definitely be a little concerned. Um, but uh, so that's interesting. So, so you nab him and you do it through this guy, Mako. Um, yeah, well, Mako and then another kid help us actually at the end of the entire investigation. We ended up indicting 62 MS-13 gang leaders, members, and their close associates, including wow. the first time ever, though we never got into the States, we indicted one of the senior leaders out of El Salvador. Uh, uh, so, so this is El Salvador giving orders to our members, and we have video or audio tape of the orders he was giving. That and I don't want to get to that, but so this is like um, this is really kind of like a dragnet. Like you're pulling in 
uh, a ton of MS guys, 60, 62 gang members and a leader. Um, so you get this guy, uh, Big Crazy, you well, testify. Big Crazy still on the streets because we arrested the murderer. We didn't make the arrest of all 62 until the till that till January 2016. So he stayed mm-hmm. on the streets until 2016. Till 2016, right? But was she? But that's the night that he, the tail light was out. No, and- no, the tail light arrest was December 2014 to get the murderer. He was in the car helping uh, move the murderer to New Jersey. Uh- Oh, and okay. So when we we arrest the murderer, he goes into state custody, mm. and then when we make our indictments in 2016, that kid came out of state custody. The state murder charge was dropped, and he was charged with RICO conspiracy. One of the predicate acts was the murder he had committed. Oh. And so, let me ask you: how, how yeah. dangerous? How dangerous is this for you um, as an investigator? Do these guys know? You're looking at them. Um, would they come and take you out? Is that something that they would never consider? Because uh, they know that's big trouble for them. Speaking of big crazy, they don't want big trouble. But were you concerned at all? At this time, I wasn't concerned for myself. Um, in 2002, we had more issues where local police officers had been surveilled by MS-13. But then I think a few things quieted down in the states where it came to to looking at police officers in El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. It is game on. They don't care who you are. The police, you know, when and, and prison guards when they when they you know they'll come out wearing civilian clothing, get on a bus, get driven around for an hour and a half, get off, change in, and then when they come out and they're ready to go to, to work, they have gla- and then they have sunglasses on, so you can't see who they are. Because the, the, they specifically targeted police officers, so yeah. it, I, I wasn't nervous. I don't think any of us were truly nervous. But I will say, during this case, I was more stressed during this case than during my four month tour in Afghanistan with what the work I was doing in Afghanistan. And I say that because. I volunteered and went to Afghanistan. I had my rifle. I had my gear. I volunteered. I'm not saying I wasn't stressed. I, I was stressed. Which but, branch of the military were you there with? Well, when I did Afghanistan, well, when I was in the army, I was uh, I was army. But in Afghanistan, I was there as an FBI agent assigned to the counter improvised explosive device team. Oh, wow. And, well, I worked with 10th Special Forces Group, and we would go out at night and hit Taliban bomb maker homes and make arrests and searches and stuff. So wow. uh, those ten- service there, that's crazy. Uh, that That's a whole other story. It, it is a story. Uh, but I'll tell you the, the FBI agents I worked with over there were top of the notch and the 10 special forces group that we worked with at that time, our group were top notch. They were great. Um, what year was that? I was there from 2007, to 2008. Wow. So, um, and so why do you say that this work with the uh, MS-13 gang was more stressful at this period? Oh, because I'm worried about my informant. I know how quick they are to kill. The, you know, like most gangs, when they want to green, they call it a green light. If they want to green light somebody they suspect of cooperating with law enforcement, they need some type of proof. So for them, it's your name now becomes is on a witness list. They go, okay, here's our proof. They're, he, they're a witness. They, they have the proof that they need to convince the leaders to, to issue the green light. MS-13, and this actually happened. We Mako tipped us off and said, the leader of this one click has got a gun on him right now. He's in a car driving with another MS-13, uh, not a homeboy, but gang member. He's a paro. So he's on his way up. They're driving together. And based on Mako's tip, we know he's got a gun. We get an unmarked cruiser behind the car. We when when they when they're speeding, we get him pulled over. Um, so we have a proper reason to stop the car. The cop knows he's out of the car, but the cop has to do his own investigative work 
to be able to find the gun and make any arrest. One of the big things we see, you know, something happens, the cop picks up on it, finds the gun, makes the arrest of the leader, and writes the report saying, I pulled the guy over speeding, he did these things, which grew me concerned, and based on my training experience, led me to believe he was armed. I found the gun, I arrested him. The passenger in the car was Joe Blow. Well, MS-13 says... Joe Blow has to be the informant, even though there's nothing there saying Joe Blow cooperated or talked to us or anything. Just the fact that he was in the car, not arrested, is enough. So in this case, they wanted to kill Joe Blow. And mm-hmm. so when we got word, it came out because Mako gets notified, hey, they want to kill him. You need to drive our little kids, or our, our pars around so they can find them and kill them. Well, they can't find them. He goes, hey, they're not having much luck. They go, fine. We want you to go down to New Jersey and pick up our hitman and bring them back. So when they do that, uh, this is all happening quickly because we've already had uh, the police kind of give the kid a warning that they're looking to kill him. He blew us off so, uh, at least once, if not twice. So. Mako gets in his car. He starts driving to New Jersey. I approach with a couple people, the kid. He's in his house. He's got his grandmother there. His father's working. His aunt's there. Uncle's there. The, 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 the aunt's husband. Their kids are there. We go in the house. He's being completely disrespectful. He's talking back to the detective who's warning him. And he finally, he's, he's making this kind of sound with his tongue. And, it pisses off the detective who yells at him. But when he yells at him, you see the grandmother's going, oh, my God, what's going You know, so I turn to the grandmother and I tell her that, you know, this is no joke. They're going to kill him. Mm. We know this. Wow. We've done our job. We've warned him. I right. can't park a police cruiser in front of his house for 24-7 because, you, you, you know, it's not feasible to do that. Where, where did you need him to go or what did you need him to well, do? I wanted him to talk to us and cooperate and tell us how, you know, mm. tell us about the trip that he took as an unaccompanied minor to get into the country. Tell us mm. how he started first joining the gang, telling us all this information and then telling us about the gang, right? I, I In order for me to put you into witness protection, I need something in return. If you want me to protect you, I need something in return. So I Mm. tell the grandmother, if he wants our protection, which we're more than willing to do, he has to talk to us. Tell his father that they will kill him. Mm. And if he wants our help, to call me. So that night, his father calls me. He doesn't speak English. I got a three-way my partner in who does. We're talking. Um, By Sunday, we had the kid in a hotel. Monday, he's at the U.S. Attorney's office. Mako is now, he's down there Monday. He picks up the hitman. He comes back. And it's Monday evening around four o'clock. He's back after driving up and down. He's like, can I go hunting with these guys? They're ready to go hunt. And if they find him, they're going to kill him. And we're like, we're watching you. You can go hunt. And mm-hmm. the next day while they're hunting and we have the car wired up, you can see the two MS-13 members. They got the machetes ready. They got the gun ready. They're all going. They're sitting in front of the house. And you can see them doing the surveillance. Is that him? Every time they see a young kid, they're, they're, they're getting ready to jump out of the car. Um, the hitman again, on tape, says, hey, look, so before we do, right after we do this, before we drop the guns, you got to peel all of your hands to get the GS, the gun residue off our hands. I did this in El Salvador, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, So once I get up there, I'll come up behind him with my garage. I'm going to stab him. You come in, hit him with a machete. You know, all this Mm -hmm. is on tape, and my source is going, dear God. And while while they're doing that on Tuesday, the the kid is in the grand jury testifying to everything that... Wow. And so wow. at the end of that, of Tuesday, when they couldn't find him, they realized something was gone. Um, they called Mako and said, hey, take the hitman back to New Jersey and we'll, we'll do something else. And wow. so now, did, did, did Mako, like you were very worried about Mako's safety. Did, was Mako worried about his own? Did he realize how much danger he was in? I think he did, but I think he, he did, but we were more worried and and that goes back to why I was more stressful because I was worried about him being killed, right? Yeah. Um, my partner and I, like, I won't lie and tell you when we go out and we have sixty-two arrest teams, 
with 10 police officers or so and all the SWAT teams hitting houses, making arrests. That's a great feeling. Mm-hmm. But it's a better feeling for, for Mario and I knowing that we've done a better, we've done something for our community to make our community safer. And so in this case, one of the things that we look at is, you know, we had a lot of, um, we had a lot of, of both legal immigrants and illegal immigrants. And, and, you know, we, you know, I know it's a big hot topic, but for me, I wasn't caring about your status in the country. I cared about whether or not you're protected while you're here. So, you know, we can talk about illegal immigration as one thing, but while you're here, whether you're legal or illegal, my job in these communities that are plagued by violence and gang violence is to pre- pre- to protect you and keep mm-hmm. you safe. And so, you know, you have this huge Central American population who is distrustful of the local police back home. They know they can't report things to us because MS-13 has come to them and said, we know where your family still lives in El Salvador. So if you go to the police, we're killing them. So it's like, again, it's not that they necessarily distrust us, but they can't come to us because they go, we talk to you and they Mm -hmm. find out they're killing our our aunt, our grandmother, our mother, who's still in El Salvador. So by doing the work we did, we made it safer for that community throughout the Boston area. And so, and, and in Boston, what were like? What was their primary business? Were they dealing drugs? I mean, what was their like? What was the motivating factor for the gang for MS thirteen? Well, what we call it, you know, a lot of gangs make their money via their, um, via their trafficking in narcotics. Mm-hmm. MS thirteen is getting into the narcotics game. They sold drugs. We did buy drugs from everyone in this case, or a lot of people in this case, but Mario and I, and Mario took the lead is they traffic in violence. And we found out after our arrest, because we arrested some significant leaders in the United States, some who cooperated where we helped solve murders throughout the United States, helped solve murders in El Salvador based on some of the information we had, that we gave to El Salvador. They did investigations that led to hundreds of arrests in in El Salvador. So we had all of this information that, that really helped out, but we learned that, you know, if you remember in 2016 and 2017, we had all this violence in, in New York and in DC and North Carolina. Well, we in Boston experienced that in 2014 and 2015, which is why we took our case down in 2016. Mm. And we had already experienced the violence, but we learned they were also doing this not only to, to wage a war against their rivals, but to make sure they had control of the territory so they could get into the narcotics business and make wow. money. So, and did I understand you right when you said you finally, you know, this was a big number, 62 people taken down. Uh, did you guys do that kind of simultaneously on a single day? Oh, yeah, that's how we do it. And I've done it many, many times over the course of our career. Uh, as I said, in 2010, at the time, it was the largest takedown. At the end of the case, we did 62 people again in that case. Uh, the day of the arrest, because we did two cases. We uh, our first arrests were done in um, in May, and then in November we finished it. So we had around fifteen in May, and then uh, forty eight in, in in November, and some were already in custody based on other things. So you know, we- you said one of the sixty two was actually a, a high level leader in El Salvador. We well, we never got him back to the states. We indicted him. We they did. did. Never, was he taken down it, the same day? Was someone in El Salvador taken down? No, they, they wouldn't do that, so we had to indict him. And he was later arrested in, with charges in El Salvador. And we were looking in 2019, 2020, we were working to get him extradited. And then um, things fell apart in 2021, and uh, we uh, they stopped extraditing people out of El Salvador. El Salvador. So is he just a, he's walking around a free free man. He's now a free man in El Salvador again. Yes. Well, wow. how many people do you think he killed? If you had to guess. Oh, uh, you can't put a number. We interviewed people who 
you know, people wouldn't believe us. Like the U.S. attorney said, oh, the person's lying. We're like, no, they're not. But they would admit to us like to 40 people. Uh, I mean, you, you back in 2015, when we were doing this case and I went to El Salvador um, to do some stuff there, Mario and I did, uh, they were averaging in May, April, May of 2015, 22 homicides a day in a country the size of Massachusetts with a population of about 6 million people. And by the way, you, Mario, maybe not, but you've got to stick out like a sore thumb in uh, El Salvador. Were you nervous there at all? <sighs> yes and no. Uh, you know, everyone met us at the airport, the tag. So we had a lot of the cops. The cops loved us because, we, you know, they, were, they already knew Mario. So and they had met me on that trip because I gave them a briefing on how we conducted gang investigations. So they knew me. They loved us. They loved, as I said, Mario, everyone loves Mario. It's funny. Uh, he's a light skinned black guy, but mm-hmm. everyone mistakes him for being Hispanic. So whoever goes up and starts speaking Spanish to him, he goes, I don't speak Spanish. I'm a black guy. I'm not a Hispanic guy, you know? So, yeah. it, you know, it's funny with the interactions where, yeah, he doesn't stick out, but everyone mistakes him for being Hispanic. But I assume you're uh, when you're in El Salvador, you're armed, right? I mean, you always. I was your- not, but my uh-huh. partner, the the tag officers were, but I can't fly to El Salvador with a gun, so they just, even as an FBI agent, you can't. We fly armed in the states, but not overseas. They have to match us up. Like so, when I flew to Afghanistan, they matched me up with the gun when I got there. El Salvador, because I was only there for a few days, they just didn't get me a gun and I was with the protection of, of the agents and the, the police officers. So, so whatever ended up happening to Mako and all this, Mako went to witness protection. It was probably one of the more difficult things I had to do because I had to get around 12 of his family members outside, out of El Salvador. So when we were, tr- I, I, again, from about November 2015 till the end of January when we made the arrests, I would say I averaged 16 to 18 hour days for work, seven days a week because of all the work that I was doing. Uh, My boss was kind of absent, so I was doing his job as well as my job. And so when I needed someone bigger to talk to people to get things done, it was me. Mm. So it was, again, as I said, the stress level was unbelievable because Make Mako was going into these meetings, and we later learned that two gang members wanted to kill him. They suspected he was he was cooperating. No one believed it, so they never got permission. But after the takedown, it came back to us that those two guys went to the leaders in prison while they're waiting for trials and said, "You should have listened to us. We wouldn't be here right now if you had given us permission to kill him." So wow. you know. And that's why I'm stressed because he wasn't armed. He's volunteering and I'm responsible for his safety. And there are times that I, you know, a lot of times we have devices, devices that enable us to hear what's going on when they're meeting. But in these big meetings that they would hold, we couldn't put that device because they searched them for it. So mm-hmm. we had a very unique, we had to create a very unique recorder to, to record things that were going on, but we couldn't hear. So he would say, oh, I'm going to go to this meeting. I'll be out in an hour. Well, an hour comes and goes, and he's not out. And now we're wondering, because they kill people in these meetings all the time. Wow. And then two hours later, like we're, you know, I can remember it's in the middle of the winter, and I'm sweating in my car with the windows down because yeah. I'm like, where is he? Why hasn't he called us? I can't hear him like I can in other instances. Mario yeah. sweating. We're, like we usually are always together. We're driving around in cars around the area, going like, "Where is he? Where is he?" And then he calls. Wow. Us. Hey, how often? Would you, how often would you speak to him? Were you talking to him every day? Every day we were talking to him, multiple times a day. Multiple times a day. Yeah. Um, so, so the big thing for us was in September of 2015, two kids are killed, and every murder that took place before that, we had we were able to identify the killers and get them off the street, get the attempted murderers off the street based on regular police work. Well, we had no idea who killed. We knew it was MS-13, but we didn't know who. And then those members admitted in October that they were the ones that killed these two kids, stabbing them 40, 50 times. What was the reason? That's how you get in the gang. You have to kill. And to them, it's a gift. Who are you to take away their ability to kill a rival gang member? 
you know, this is what they're about. That you know, to them, they're walking with the beast. I have kids on table go, yeah, I had the devil in me that night. I can't wait till I have him again. It was beautiful. Um, wow. I was chopping this guy. It reminded me when I worked in the butcher shop when I would trim fat off. You know, was I'm slicing in him and trying to kill him. I I was this close to getting his head cut off before we had to abandon cutting this head off. Like so, this kid oh. almost. A, decapitated you know and they're proud of it and and so that we've got them on tape so at that point we said you know we we have to take it down but to keep this mako safe um we have to get his family out we have to do the indictment because we just can't go arrest these guys and leave the other 60 out because they'll flee and we'll never find them because they'll go everywhere so we're we're planning the takedown i've i've got plans to put the the mako's family in protection protective custody in El Salvador. So the day we do the takedown, they go out, the tag goes out and grabs the family at three in the morning and gets them out out of out of out of Gang Central and the downtown city they were living in and got them in to protective custody and we're out making arrests. And we know for a fact they'll kill the family. I have on tape where the the one of the senior leaders in the states with the that leader in El Salvador, they're talking about how if we can't get the snitches, we'll go after their families and we'll kill them. They're on tape right. talking about it. So, without giving uh, obviously anything away, um, so Mako is in witness protection. I mean, people know what he looks like. Um, did he have to have his like you know identity change? How does that well, all work? Protect, they do. They well, most people leave witness protection. Most people never stay because the rules are so strict, and the uh-huh. marshals say if you don't follow the rules, we'll kick you out. But they get a new identity, they get new things, they get relocated to a region where they say you're, you'll be safe here. And so once they're re, once they're done that and they've been there, like after two years, Mako said, you know, I've got a young girl, she's going to get on social media, that will get me kicked out. So they they voluntarily stepped out of the program. Um, Do you think there's a shot that uh, he could face retribution one day? Like people know he's found out. him. Obvi- yes, but. You know, he's in a very safe spot. I, I never knew where he was till he left. And then he called me and said, hey, how are you? You know, he went to check in. My, you know, so, but I, I'll never give up where he is. I, I won't talk about him. You still talk to him? Yeah, he calls me. Uh, I have some sources that call me to the state to tell me what they're doing. And, and, and this is where, again, I come in and say, this gives me more pleasure. When you take a criminal, you take a gang member and, and, they turn their life around and they're now productive citizens and, you know, they're doing the right thing. They're working. I have one source from a case who is a real estate agent making big bucks selling, selling houses in the state we moved them to. Right. Yeah. And he was a member of MS 13 at one point. No, this kid wasn't, he was, yeah. he was just a drug dealer to the gangs, but um, I approached him and said, you got a choice today. You're going to go to jail. Or you're going to work for me because I, I have evidence that you're selling drugs. And he said, I don't want to go to jail. I want to leave because I have a brand new baby. And so this kid started working for us in the first, we approached him on a Friday, give him the option. Monday, he comes to work for us and he brings his three, three week old baby. And we're like, what's this? He goes, well, my wife works. I'm the one who doesn't work. I take, I'm Mr. Mom. I take care of the baby at home. I'm like, mm-hmm. you can't, but you brought him to a drug deal. Well, yeah, I mean, we sell drugs with our kids all the time, you know, and I, I'm sitting there going, I can't let you go out because if something happens, I can see it now. FBI agent allows a three month old or three week old to be killed during a drug controlled drug buy that we do. Right. So yeah. one of the detectives, every time he came to work for us, one of the detectives who was a father would babysit the kid during the drug deals that we would do with the, the store <laughs> together. That's a whole that's a whole other story again. Well, that's amazing. So. Jeff Wood, FBI agent, uh, takes down 62 members of MS-13. Jeff is a retired FBI special agent out of Boston. As you just heard, he focused on gangs and gang violence. And obviously, as a seasoned investigator, a friend of the show, Jeff, we've got to get you back on for uh, some other stories, get you back in the mix. I'm looking forward to it. Just let me know when, and I'll, I'll make it happen. I'm retired. Uh, I've got a retirement gig that's easy. It's primarily remote so i can do it we'll have you back on so thank you thank you love you boston love you america until next time